Thank you. I want to begin by uh, acknowledging the Minister of Health for bringing forward this legislation that will repeal Bill 29 and 94. I want to acknowledge the Minister of Labour for his active support for this initiative and the Deputy Speaker who left the chair just a few moments ago, who certainly knows these issues firsthand. Um, but most of, all, most of all, Honourable Speaker, I want to acknowledge the courage of the healthcare workers of British Columbia who have worked for this day, who have fought for this day, who've shown the courage to persevere for almost 17 years waiting for this day. Honourable Speaker, the member opposite concluded by saying she supports the intention of this bill, but to be honest, most of her comments seem to not support the substance of the bill. I want to, I have the great honour and privilege of representing healthcare workers and the hospital employees for six and a half years. And I want to take most of my time sharing my experience of what Bill 29 and Bill 94 meant for those healthcare workers and the impact of Bill 29 and Bill 94 on vulnerable seniors, on our frail elderly, on our parents and our grandparents and our loved ones in care. The Minister of Health has, also, has already made clear who lost their jobs. It was the single biggest layoff of women workers in Canadian history, Honourable Speaker, close to 10,000 workers, the majority of them women, also the majority of them workers of colour. Let's talk about the cost, Honourable Speaker. The government was intent, Gordon Campbell government was intent on privatising health care and intent on provoking, frankly, a race to the bottom when it affect, where it affects the wages and the working conditions of people who provide care, but also, frankly, a race to the bottom in the provision of seniors' care in the province of British Columbia. And if we want to talk about the cost of that, Honourable Speaker, these workers, nine or 10,000 workers who were laid off, they were guilty of nothing except pouring their hearts and their souls into working in healthcare every single day. They worked in housekeeping, they worked in food services, they work in seniors' care. And I can't tell you how many of them over the years said, what did we do wrong to deserve this? All we care about is providing quality care. All we care about is providing quality services. And they were working in jobs, Honourable Speaker, where they were earning decent family-supporting wages. Not high wages, not Cadillac benefit plans, but they were able to support their families. They had decent family-supporting jobs. And after the layoffs began in 2004, workers went from $18 or $20 an hour, not huge amounts of money, and initially, when contractors were brought in, they were paying people $8 an hour, but they couldn't attract people at that wage and they moved to $10 an hour. And Honourable Speaker, those workers had to fight and fight and fight over many years to first get up to $13 an hour and then to the princely sum of $15 an hour. And there are people in my community, when I am out in the community or when I knock on doors to this day People talk to me about what the experience was like for their families. This wasn't just one person in a family. Often, sometimes it was the mother and the father. And some of my colleagues have told me that often the ch their children, son or daughter-in-law, also worked in health care. People lost their jobs. People had to declare bankruptcy. People suffered incredible financial crises, personal crises, psychological crises. And then, Many of them applied to get jobs with the contractors. And, Honourable Speaker, they would then reorganize a, a right under the Constitution of Canada to join a union, to bargain collectively, and then often a whole lot of them would be fired. And a contract would be negotiated, people would be able to come back if they were prepared to take a major, major cut in pay. 
And Honourable Speaker, Bill 29 and 94 also laid the groundwork for what happened in uh, 2004 when the wages of healthcare workers were rolled back 15 per cent. Because in a race to the bottom, the lowest, if, when you've got wages being paid of $10 an hour, it gave the Gordon Campbell government the ability to push wages down. Four bells. So, Honourable Speaker, Bill 29 not only had a direct impact on the workers uh, directly affected in housekeeping, in food services and in seniors' care, it also laid the groundwork for robbing tens of thousands of other people who work in health care of decent family-supporting jobs. So the member opposite talked about flexibility. Well, what the flexibility meant, Honourable Speaker, was it was okay. It was a license given to contractors, to, uh, not just health authorities to contract out in the first place, but contracts to be flipped over and over and over again. And, Honourable Speaker, as I, as I stand in my place in this debate, I see the faces of the people who work in health care, who lost their jobs, sometimes were rehired, had to reorganize, sometimes were fired again. And I think of the incredible courage of people like Carlita and Harjit and so many other people who were involved in the campaign that took 16 full years to get these bills rescinded. And Honourable Speaker, I remember very well sitting in a circle with people who were employed by the contractors and having a discussion about the need for a living wage. And workers decided together that they were going to go out in the community and they were going to launch a campaign both for themselves but other people in the community under the theme, work should lift you out of poverty, not keep you there. Because, Honourable Speaker, these people worked full time, they often worked two jobs, and they still couldn't make a decent living wage for their families. And as we went around the table that day and asked some of these workers, what would a living wage mean to you? They didn't talk about being able to go on fancy vacations. They didn't talk about being able to go out for nice dinners. I remember, like it was yesterday, one woman saying, I get up really early in the morning before my kids are up. I don't get to see them before they go to school. Then I go to my second job, and by the time I get home at night, my kids are in bed and I don't get to see them. A living wage for me she said, would mean I would be able to see my children. Another worker who spoke, who was a Chilean refugee, he said, my daughter has incredible musical talent. I want what every other parent wants. If a child has talent, I want the ability for my child to be able to pursue her musical talent. A living wage for me would mean my daughter would be able to take music lessons. And to a person, all of those people said, this is about our family. This is about our kids. Well, Honourable Speaker, over time, these workers slowly improved their wages and their working conditions, although they are still many dollars below what they were earning before, and that has a huge impact on their families. But it's important when we talk about cost, Honourable Speaker, to remember that as a result of the egregious actions taken by this government, and when the case went to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled for the first time in Canadian history, in the first time in legal and labour relations history in this country, that it, was, that it was imperative to redefine what rights meant, what collective rights meant under the Charter. And for the first time in Canadian history, as a direct result of this government's egregious actions, the Supreme Court said, yes, in fact, collective bargaining rights are charter-protected rights, and they will be from this day forward. And again, I salute the working people, the working men and women who kept at it, 
who persevered, who showed determination and courage year after year, year after year, and who ended up not winning enormous wages for themselves, but changing, changing, uh, changing the ground rules for working people across this country as a, as a result of the Supreme Court of Canada decision. I want to talk about the impact of Bill 29 and especially Bill 94 on seniors. But I want to start, I want to start with a report from the Ombudsperson in British Columbia, and this is a report that was issued as a result of what happened, not as, a, not as a direct result of Bill 29 or 94, but the closure of a senior's care home called Cowich and Lodge in Duncan that had resulted in massive dislocation of the workers. In that decision, in that report issued by the BC Ombudsperson, she said, and I quote, mass replacement of staff can occur when facility operators switch from contracting with one private service provider to another, such turnovers can disrupt the lives of seniors in residential care, especially those residents whose core needs are complex. Over time, long-term staff acquire specialized knowledge of these needs, so the simultaneous replacement of many employees can make it difficult for the seniors because continuity of care is disrupted. This is particularly the case for residents with dementia. It can also be stressful for families since they often need to provide extra support to their relatives. Now, Honourable Speaker, that was the words of the Ombudsperson in 2008. But any of us who have family members in care, and I certainly, my father died in the 1990s, but he was in seniors care. There are very few people in this house who don't either have parents or grandparents or know someone who's in seniors care. And we know that the care staff who care for them, they deal with their most intimate care needs. They deal with feeding them, they deal with bathing them, they deal with toileting them, and they are also there to hold their hands and comfort them, sometimes in their loneliness, sometimes in fear at the end of their lives. And Honourable Speaker, what Bill 94 did, what the member opposite referred to as flexibility, flexibility, what it did to these seniors in care was tear away care providers from them and disrupt that close and intimate relationship that exists between people who are caring for seniors. And Honourable Speaker, in some places, that happened not just once, but twice, three times, four times, sometimes even five or six times in the same care home. Imagine what that would do to one of our loved ones when care is disrupted in that way over and over and over again. We've certainly seen that in places like uh, Nanaimo Seniors Village, where after Bill 29's passage, they attempted to negotiate a $10 an hour wage cut. Subsequently, there was contracting out, more contracting out over and over and over again. That contract was flipped four times, Honourable Speaker, each time the workers had to engage in a race to the bottom, saying, I'll work for $15 an hour. No, I'll work for 14 No, I'll work for 13 Sold to the lowest bidder. But not only that, the seniors in those care facilities had their care disrupted over and over and over again. And there is significant research, Honourable Speaker, that shows that that affects not just the acuity, not just the the, the, the kind of the illness and the severity of the illness that seniors are living with, the severity of their health conditions, it also affects mortality. We've seen the same thing at the Inglewood Care Center uh, on the North Shore, in West Vancouver, Honorable Speaker. That is perhaps the most extreme case of contract flipping in the province and contract uh, residential care sector there has contracted out um, those contracts six to eight times since 2003, depending on whether you're speaking strictly about care or also housekeeping and food services. Six to eight times, Honourable Speaker. Six to eight times. Honourable Speaker, this is... This bill 
rescinds Bill 29 and 94 in its entirety. It does not undo the damage that these workers experienced for many, many years. It doesn't undo the damage to seniors and their well-being. Many of those seniors are not alive to speak for themselves, but certainly I want to also salute the courage of the families of seniors in care who also worked very, very hard and spoke up repeatedly over the years in order to say this is bad legislation, it's bad for seniors' care, and it needs to be changed. What this bill does do is rescind the parts of the Labour Code that discriminate against health care workers and only health care workers saying successor rights should not exist for health care workers. Honourable Speaker, the day, that this the day that the Minister of Health introduced this legislation, there was a convention occurring at the same time of the Hospital Employees Union. And they broadcast the proceedings in this House live in that uh, hall. And Honourable Speaker, I'm sure that if there had been a BCGU convention or any other conventions in progress, there would have been the same reaction. I am told that there was not a dry eye in the entire room. The room came together as one and they wept. They wept with joy that this day had finally come. They also wept remembering everything that they had been subjected to over many, many years. Honourable Speaker, healthcare workers have waited almost 17 years for this day to come. And again, I salute the Health Minister, the Minister of Labour, the Premier, and I salute those workers who had the courage to carry on. To carry on doing some of the most important work in our society. I know that it was popular on the other side of the House at the time to de denigrate the work of housekeeping workers and of food service workers, referring to housekeeping uh, workers by one uh, previous member of the House of the Legislature opposite as unskilled toilet bowl, bowl cleaners. Unskilled toilet bowl cleaners, Honourable Speaker. These are people who ensured the cleanliness of our health care facilities. The people who work in food services did their best every single day despite limited budgets to provide the best possible care. They are critical parts of the team in health care, Honourable Speaker. And let me just also say that the seniors in this province have suffered as a result of this. That cannot be undone. But, Honourable Speaker, passing this legislation will create the conditions, together with the major initiatives that our government has taken to change the hours of care, the staffing levels in seniors' care homes, so that seniors in British Columbia finally begin to get the dignified respect that they deserve. Honourable Speaker, today is a good day for health care in British Columbia. It is a day when we begin to give back to health care workers the respect that they deserve. It's a day when we recommit ourselves to ensuring that our parents and our grandparents and our loved ones who have given their all to their families and to this province and helped to build this province and build this country, this is an important step forward ensure, to ensuring that they get the dignity and respect that they deserve in their last years. And, Honourable Speaker, this is an important step forward in building a stronger public health care system in the province of British Columbia to, to serve British Columbians in every corner of this province. I'm proud to stand in my place and support this bill that finally rescinds Bill 29 and Bill 94 and the destruction that it wreaked in health care in British Columbia. Thank you, Minister. Recognize the Minister of Citizen Services. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. It's uh, with great pleasure today that I rise to speak in support of this legislation. But before I start talking about the repealing of Bill 29 and uh, 94, I want to uh, pay my respects and admiration to the Health Minister and really appreciate the fact that this legislation was brought forward and it's been brought forward as quickly as it has been to address a wrong 
that was done 17 or 16 years ago. Uh, when we all run to get elected, uh, Madam Speaker, we all have many reasons, many reasons why we run for office. Doesn't matter which side of the house we sit on. But I can tell you, it's when you get to pass legislation like this legislation that you think, yes, I am glad we are here and I'm glad we're going to be doing something that's going to make a difference to thousands upon thousands of British Columbians. In 2002, with a stroke of a pen and a legislation being proclaimed, 8,000 workers were fired through contracting out because of Bill 29. As my colleague from New Westminster said so eloquently, there they were making what anybody would consider a living wage of about 18 bucks an hour one day, and next day, the very same job was eight, nine, or $10 an hour. Imagine what that does to you as a worker, when one day you're working for 18, and the next day you're expected to do exactly the same job for half your wage. And I personally cannot even imagine the anguish that those workers went through. But not only that, what we've seen since then, of course, because the legislation enabled it, was even when those workers organized. When those workers organized, formed a union, and got to the position where they could negotiate, the contract flipping that occurred was ongoing. And it's because of that and many other reasons, I have so much respect for the hospital employees and for their uh, union. Because despite all of the challenges they faced, they didn't give up. They kept speaking up. They kept fighting for their rights. And every time they stood up, they were knocked back again when the contract was flipped and the workers rose again. And that takes a certain amount of courage, persistence. And that's the key thing I heard when I was uh, visiting the convention, just very, very briefly. Worker after worker who came up and said, we never thought this day would come. So to the labor minister, to the health minister, thank you for the work you've done on this. And to my colleague from New Westminster, who led that group of uh, valiant heroes during some of the most heartbreaking times, and I'm going to use the word heartbreaking times, for her courage at that time. And I know for her, continue. Okay, thank you. And I have a lot of respect for my colleague from New Westminster for her advocacy and her passion and her ongoing commitment to making it better for workers. And I know that um, it warmed my heart when I saw her on the stage and how, I cannot imagine how she felt, but I do know how I felt that day, this exhilaration that we as a government are able to do something for a group of workers that do incredible work. Madam Speaker, my mom is, um, has been in and out of hospital a fair bit recently. She's 93 and uh, has had a series of health issues. And I can tell you as much as the doctors and nurses who take care of her, just as important are all the other workers at that hospital. She looks forward to the different people she sees, but what happened with contract flipping is that those people were changing all the time as well. And that creates a lot of fear in senior people. And when my father, as he was struggling with Alzheimer's, in the early stages of Alzheimer's, I know how upset he would get when almost every 
other day there was a new worker in place. And a lot of that was happening because people couldn't make a decent living and because of the contract flipping. And what I'm looking forward to is that this legislation that our um, hardworking health minister has brought forward will ensure, will ensure some stability. Not only is it going to be good for those who work in healthcare, in providing critical services in food and janitorial services, and all of those, but it's going to be really good for those who are dependent on their services, whether they are in a hospital, or whether they are in a care home, or whether they are in a rehabilitation facility. All of that is critical. If any of you have ever visited Surrey Memorial Hospital, you know it's a happening place. The, uh, it's a very busy place. We have a one hospital in a very large city, and uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank our health minister for opening an urgent uh, primary care unit there just last week, and uh, people from Surrey are looking forward to that because that's going to take a lot of the pressure off our emergency room and is going to provide much needed uh, urgent care services to those who live there. But when I'm at the hospital, as I go in to see my mom when I'm not here, what I see are staff who are incredibly hardworking, incredibly hardworking and committed to doing their job and their very best. But what they tell us over and over again as we are there as a family is what they have experienced over the last number of years. And I can tell you this last week when I was at the hospital and visiting, I received lots of hugs. Lots of people said, when you get back, say thank you to Minister Dix. And so, Minister, sorry, Minister of Health. My apologies, Madam Speaker. So, uh, to the Minister of Health, lots of thank you from uh, a lot of the healthcare workers that I have come into contact with. And once again, as I said at the beginning, Madam Speaker, I'm so, so proud to be part of a government that is showing that it has a heart, it cares about workers, it cares about our healthcare services, and it cares about looking after our seniors and providing, and providing British Columbians with the kind of stability they look for. I am so, so proud to be supporting this legislation. Thank you, Minister. Recognize the Minister of Labor. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. And, and it, is, uh, it is a bit of honor that I stand here today uh, to, to support Bill 47. Uh, Mr. Spe uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I just uh, can't find words to say thank you to the Minister of Health. Uh, thank you to all those thousands of workers who uh, never relent in their attempt to, to right the wrong and, and to find uh, that uh, the day will come that I will be part of, of, uh, uh, of the debate that I will engage in to finally, finally in 13 years of me being elected in this House, that we will actually be voting, debating and voting on a bill that was illegal, that was declared illegal, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker. I just want to say, the Bill 29 and 94, it represented abuse of power, represented denial of constitutional rights to the workers, it represented creating a second class workers, it represented disrespect towards the working people, and it in fact represent total contempt shown by that government towards the working people. With this Bill 47, we're changing all that. We are reversing all of that. What with this Bill 47 does, it says to all the working people of this province that this government respect workers, that this government value the works that they do, that this government obey the law of the land and the constitutional rights that the workers have in this province, in this country, Madam Speaker, are being preserved once again. 
Madam Speaker, 8,000, 8,000 of those workers, most of them were immigrants and visible minorities, were fired with the stroke of a pen by then government over what? Over what, Madam Speaker? It wasn't about saving money. It was ideologically and politically dri driven decision so that some of their friends, the internationals, can come in and make profit on the backs of our health care, on the backs of those workers, on the backs of those who need those services, Madam Speaker. That was wrong then, it was wrong now, and that's why this Bill 47 addresses those wrongs. Madam Speaker, I just want to say that not only that it profoundly affected negatively those thousands of workers and their families, it also impacted the services that they provided to our seniors. Those long-term care facilities, the seniors, for many of them, the workers that provide them care and service, and many times those are the only family that they know. Those are the people that they have intimate relations developed over the years. And when you fire them over and over through contract flipping, what you are doing is you are basically telling those seniors, you're telling those seniors that they don't matter, that the bottom line is what driven their decisions. That was that government, Madam Speaker, but there's a new day, there's a new government, and we're saying every worker matters, those seniors matter, and that's what we're doing, is restoring the rights for the working people in this province through this bill, and restoring the services that those seniors deserve and need. Madam Speaker, I know the time is running out. The Mr. Mr. of Health would like to, uh, to, I'm sure, finish this debate, but I just wanna say how proud I am to participate in this debate. How proud those families and those workers are now, and all workers in this province, Finally, they see that there's a government that actually care about working people in this province, that care their rights, they care about health and safety. Madam Speaker, this day, this province, in this house, I just can't say thank you enough to all those workers who never relent. They continue with their with the advocacy, continued with their, with their struggle, they never gave up. That's what gave us the inspiration. That's what gave me the inspiration to continue to fight for what is right. Madam Speaker, that's what who we are. We should never forget. You know, the decision that we make here today, we will be judged in 50, 40, 100 years down the road. And the decision that the previous government made 16 years ago clearly were wrong. You don't have to wait 50 years to make that decision. The Supreme Court of Canada said those decisions were illegal. It took 20 minutes to all those judges to take a look at it and say, government, you were wrong. That decision was illegal. Go fix it. How could a government do that to its own citizens? It's hard to believe, but it happened. That's why who the government is matters. It matters in lives of, of, of a people of the province. That's why this government made a decision that people should come first and foremost when we are developing our policies. Not some selective groups, the people that only support us, that those are the only people we are going to support. Those who funded our campaigns. Madam Speaker, that's not how you run governments. We have seen in the federal government, we have seen in this house, apologies for past government's mistakes. And this one will be in the history of this province. The wrongs committed by a government 16 years ago, and also it'll be in the history of this province that right was, the wrong was righted in this house by the current government. Madam Speaker, with that, I just want to take my space, and I know the minister is waiting to, to finish the debate, and I really, really feel so proud to be part of this debate, and I want to say thank you to thousands of those workers, and I want to say thank you 
to the, to the Minister of uh, Mental Health and Minister of, he uh, Minister of Health for, for, for showing the leadership and, and taking this struggle and the fight so that we are at this stage to make the right decision. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Seeing no further speakers, the Minister closes debate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. Thank you to uh, my colleagues on both sides of the House for participating in the debate. It's uh, an important moment for healthcare workers. I want to say just a, a couple of things briefly. I, I think that um, I'd say it's a small correction uh, to what my colleague from Coquitlam Berg Mountain said. Uh, she said that the, I think she said the BC Liberals gave 500 million to seniors care. Of course, 285 million of that is from the federal government, so it didn't come from the government, and only 30 million was actually in the budget. I don't say that to be, to, to an exchange, let's say this is what we have to do together now. The issue of whether um, we have enough care is something that all of us contribute to and have to contribute to, and it involves really hard decisions. We have a plan, a plan for seniors care, that in total will be $1.048 billion and addresses a historic underfunding of the sector at a time when the number of seniors is growing. And my point is, and the point of this legislation, is not that it solves every problem in seniors' care, but it corrects the fundamental injustice and it brings us all together as part of the conversation. You cannot have one group of workers not have the same rights as everyone else and have a society that works well and works together to deal with what is a fundamental problem of coming together and providing seniors care in the future. I think that the legislation that was passed in 2002 and 2003 wasn't the right path. And we're trying to build a different one. When we said we at, we're adding um, care aids and supports to seniors care, you should understand what that is because sometimes people get confused between public care and nonprofit care and private care overwhelming amount of that care and that money will go to private and nonprofit care homes from our government, private and nonprofit care homes, because it was those care homes that were by decision of the previous government understaffed, right? It was healthcare owned and operated ones that were at the 3.36 or close to it, and the others that weren't. My point is that we have to get past these old fights, but we can only do so by restoring justice to healthcare workers, justice in society, and so that we can all go forward together on all sides to build a better healthcare system. With that, I look forward to the questions from my colleagues at uh, committee stage, and I move second reading.